Go ahead and call the meeting to order. This is the regular monthly meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education on Wednesday, October 16th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. As a reminder, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board during the reception of visitors later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over there to my right. All right. With that, we're going to go ahead and start with the flag salute with Henry Puffer School. Thank you for welcoming us tonight. We have our Henry Puffer Student Council officers here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And welcome Principal Wazak and Puffer School. Uh, I would like to first uh, start off by introducing Ms. Caroline Forbes, representing our student council, along with our student representatives. Thank you. Like Curtis Adams, Caroline Forbes, and these are four wonderful student council representatives that we have here today. Some goals we are trying to accomplish are to fundraise for everybody who is offered, 
to fundraise for local and national charities such as St. Jude's and Willis Hope to help with Thanksgiving dinner baskets for community families to collect Halloween candy for candy troops to collect top tab, top tabs the Brown Family Foundation and finally to help spread the cheese kind message with the students and Thank you for this opportunity. Be sure to look at the Community 58 newsletter throughout the year to see the awesome things that Henry Public Student Council takes part in. Thank you, Student Council reps, for being here to share all about the great things that we do here at Puffer. Uh, I'd like to share some highlights about Puffer as well. Uh, with an emphasis on educating the whole child, we strive to provide rigorous academics, uh, incorporate social emotional learning, and engage our families in our community. To get a better idea of what's happening at Henry Puffer, I thought I would take you on a visual tour of our building with this video. Enjoy. This year at Henry Puffer School, we have embraced the theme, Choose Kind. This message is spread throughout the school, both visually and through our daily interactions with students. Every morning, we share a quote or challenge about choosing kind on the daily announcements. Even our Wednesday watchdogs participate by reinforcing these positive messages. Every day, we strive to choose kind. Our kindness quote of the day is, words are like toothpaste, easy to come out, hard to put back in. Think about your words before they come out. Have a great day and remember to choose kind. Hi, my name is Andrew Kupish. I'm a fifth grade teacher here at Henry Puffer School. Um, and Watch Dogs is a wonderful program because it gets positive male role models into the school in hopes of really just positively augmenting the student's school experience. It also sends a lot of word of mouth ambassadors into the community because after visiting uh, the school and seeing what their son or daughter is learning in the classroom and seeing all the other classrooms as well. They just want to go home and share that at the dinner table, at the block parties, and you know, dads just want to talk positively about what is going on in the school and who would want that. Our students have the opportunity to earn Panther pencils every Wednesday for demonstrating acts of kindness. Hi, I'm Bray Judicki, sixth grade teacher at Henry Puffer School. Um, I just wanted to give a little shout out to our Puffer families. We started a few years ago in order to help strengthen the bonds in our school community. We get together once a month to chat and do a fun little activity and it really gives students and teachers who might not interact on a daily basis with each other to get to know and build relationships. And as a sixth grade teacher, I really enjoy getting to know the younger students and watch them learn and grow throughout their school career. Here are a few examples of team building activities our students do together when they are with their Puffer families. Beyond the work that we do to incorporate kind behavior, social emotional learning, and parent engagement, we would like to highlight all that our staff and students have worked toward in the areas of academic achievement and student growth. This school year, our school improvement goals in math and reading are based on the growth of our students from the spring of 2019 to the spring of 2020 based on the NWEA math assessment. Take a look inside our fourth grade classrooms to see how number corners are enhancing our math instruction and allowing our students to engage in rigorous mathematical discussions. It's gonna add up every time. We saw like, when we first started, we had a coin and two arrays, and we had, and after that, we had two coins and three things, three ways to show 20. And now we're gonna have four ways to show a quarter. to show our next coin? Yes. Hi, I'm Janet Reynolds. I teach fourth grade at Henry Puffer. We really like the number corner piece of the Bridges program. It fosters conversations between the students about math concepts, which helps build number sense. In order to foster growth and ensure maximum engagement, our primary classrooms do a wonderful job of ensuring that our students have consistent access to small group instruction. Take a look at our kindergarten reading groups in action. Hi, I'm Jennifer Woods, reading specialist. 
I am Shannon Arnold, the kindergarten teacher. And I'm Carrie Murphy, the kindergarten teacher. At Puffer School, our reading program includes small group reading instruction. During small group time, we are able to differentiate student lessons to their instructional levels. Small group lessons include phonemic awareness activities, guided reading practice, and opportunities to practice writing skills. These small group interactions also provide us opportunities for immediate feedback to students about their learning and helps us build relationships with each other. Thank you for taking this digital tour of Henry Puffer School. So although our, there are many more wonderful things happening at Henry Puffer, uh, we could only share a few tonight, uh, but I would invite any of our board members to Puffer at any time to see our staff and students. Uh, being new to Henry Puffer, uh, one of my favorite things that I have learned is that our school is truly a family. Uh, this includes students, staff, parents, and community members. Uh, we could not do many of the things that we do uh, without our very involved parent community. So at this time, I would like to introduce our PTA co-presidents, Kristen Noonan and Kelly Matusia. And we would just like to thank the board for inviting us to come here tonight and let us tell you a little bit about our wonderful school and our PTA. So our PTA is um, second to none. We have a wonderful group of parent volunteers, teachers who really go above and beyond for our students. Um, we have fundraising. We do a fundraiser in the uh, fall, which is our Charleston Wrap. We do a big, bigger fundraiser in the spring, which is used to be a trivia night. Um, kind of morphed into whoever takes it on can share and uh, do what they would like with it. But with those two big fundraisers, we raise enough funds throughout the year to um, help support all the programs that we run. And over the last three years, we've, with the money that we've raised, we have given over $50,000 back into our school community, which is awesome. Um, some of the programs that we do, we have a staff uh, teacher appreciation week. Um, at the end of every year, we allow the teachers to, um, and some parents to request gifts or enrichments for, I wouldn't say gifts, enrichments for um, the staff or students to be used in the building. And so that's where we typically end up giving away a lot of our money that goes back into our school then, which is excellent. So our school also offers a talent show. We provide school supplies to students that cannot afford them. Um, we have the watchdogs program, which Mrs. Wozniak mentioned, which is amazing. So I think our watchdogs filled up. We've, this is the second year, I believe, that we've done it now. And our watchdogs, our dads, are filled up through the whole year. So I don't know if there are too many spots left available for that, which is great to see. Let's see. I would say our biggest thing is that we want to build a sense of community uh, within our school and know that when our kindergarten parents come in or any new families that come in that they are welcomed into this community that we have. So Downers Grove is a big community um, with a very small town feel and so we feel that very close in our schools and it's really our school. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I will mention also oh, yeah. a couple more things we have. I did not mention. Um, we provide, so with these funds that we raise then, we're able to provide a lot of free events back to our families throughout the year, which is awesome, so that we're not charging for everything that they do come to do to participate in. So we have a pumpkin carving, all the kids that's coming up in another week and a half. Parents and families come with their kids. They carve their pumpkins. We light them up all outside and take pictures. So this is kind of something that is kind of cool um, and that's a free event we have a daddy daughter dance we have a mother son event um, <coughs> we have a breakfast, breakfast with santa a holiday event where we raised over i believe 700 dollars last year that all was given back to our school and um, social workers our secretary and things take that money and then went and bought gift cards and gave it to students in need at our school so we do a lot of things hopefully giving back to you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much for your hard work and dedication. It's really appreciated. Thank you, Kristen and Kelly. I would now like to introduce Lauren Singdalson and Michelle Morgan, um, our co-presidents of the Everybody Plays at Puffer Committee.
Good evening. My name is Lauren Singh Dolson, and I am pleased to represent Everybody Plays at Puffer, also known as EPAP, tonight. We are a separate, parent led nonprofit organization working to replace our over 30 year old wooden playground. EPAP received its nonprofit status last summer, and for the past year, we have been fundraising our hearts out. I am thrilled to report that our efforts have put us um, to the point where we've reached our phase one fundraising goal. EPAP is working on the design of our playground and we will host a design day when Puffer kids are invited to dream big and to give us input on what they would like their playground to look like. We are working with the district to coordinate our community-led installation of our playground which will take place in summer of 2020. I'd like to share just a few of our activities and what we've been working on. We recently hosted a very large golf outing. We had a few local celebrities there like Dr. Russell. <laughs> it was a Mrs. Tough <laughs> Mrs. Wazak was there, a high school golfer or college golfer, I'm sorry. And Jacqueline Kadard, who holds a record for longest drive, um, second long, longest in the world. Pretty amazing. <laughs> um, true, it's a true story. Google her. Um, <laughs> last fall, we had a Giving Tuesday campaign where we encouraged Puffer kids to do push ups for the playground, and that inspired over $5,000 worth of giving. This September, we distributed a free pair of gym shoes to each child at Puffer. This was an in-kind donation that we received from Super Heroic Shoe Company, and as a way of saying thank you to everyone in our school and community for the support, we gave those shoes back to our kiddos. Last year, we teamed up with Climb Higher at Highland for a holiday movie fundraiser. It was really meaningful for our two schools to pull together with a common cause of raising funds for playgrounds. You may have heard that the Timken Foundation, who graciously gives back to the Downers Grove community, selected EPAP to receive a $70,000 grant. The Timken Foundation has been paving the path for corporate giving, and EPAP is honored to have received their support for our project. Our fundraising total is currently $166,000. We would not be here without the tireless work of many puffer parents or the support of our community or our PTA. We are there very thankful for having Jacqueline Kadard, our district liaison, serving on our board. And it has been a pleasure collaborating with the district's entire buildings and grounds team with Kevin Barta leading the way. Our hope is that our final project will be a playground that will serve children of varying abilities at Puffer School and serve the district at large for years to come. Thank you. Can I just say something really fast? So I just wanted to also do a shout out to all of Henry Puffer. Uh, my daughter was a preschool student there for two years and now she's in sixth grade and she's, when we drive down Belmont, she still refers to Henry Puffer as her second school. <laughs> so as a thank you to all the families who attend classes there, um, Henry Puffer is near and dear to our hearts as well. Thank you. Uh, just again, thank you for having us and thank you to our student council representatives for, for leading us this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And we do have a, a couple of gifts for all of our representatives from uh, the student council. Yeah, and, and if uh, you guys would all come gather up here, uh, all the folks from Puffer, we'd like to have a picture with you as well. That's amazing.
Thank you, everyone. All right. Oh. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our first non-action report uh, with the spotlight on our schools tonight with uh, Todd Drayfall on the tax levy. That time of year, <clears throat> excuse me. It's that time of year again. Uh, we start uh, the tax levy process this month, and then uh, the board will have uh, the action item next month. Uh, because many of the board members are new, uh, we thought we would take a few moments uh, and review just overall the cycle uh, in, in short order as to how the process is. Um, property tax cycle uh, in the state of Illinois: local district, school districts, local units of governments. The uh, majority of their funding comes from local property taxes. Uh, we didn't invent the system. It has been this way for a very long time. Uh, though all of us would like to have some level of change, this is, um, this is the format that we have. Um, the initial piece the, on the valuation side, you have an entire structure uh, through the township assessors who assess the property uh, and develop a, a value structure. Uh, they go through a process where they turn uh, the information over to the uh, county supervisor of assessments. They do analysis, sales ratio study. Uh, if there is a multiplier or a, a, a system that, that they need to bring up or down the valuations, they apply that. Uh, notices go out to the community and there's uh, publications. Uh, people have an opportunity to challenge their, their assessments at that point. It goes through a board of review at the county level. Uh, the board of review is an appointed um, board uh, from the county that hears those complaints and makes a determination from there. The board of review turns over their records to the county clerk. Uh, at that point, uh, through that process, we start our process, and that is the tax levy process. Um, develop a request based on our budget. Um, and the estimates that we think uh, where the numbers are going to be. The part is that county, that assessment piece for the 2019 tax levy started January of 2019. We will not know the valuations of any of the property until March, April of 2020, uh, shortly before the bills go out when we get information from the county clerk's office. Our request, excuse me, our request system goes in now. Uh, so we do it with estimates and, and based on what we uh, think we're going to be, and, and we certainly budget uh, conservatively um, on the formats that we have to make sure we have enough funds to come in. Um, we request on the higher end and budget on the lower end. Uh, the board adopts and approves the levy, must file it with the county clerk by the last Tuesday in December, uh, and then the county clerk takes both sides and puts those together in the springs. The county clerk calculates the tax rates, uh, puts out some information back and forth, and allows us to know what, what they're at, uh, turns it over to the county treasurer to collect the taxes and the bills go out. The first half of the taxes are due about 30 days, uh, well, 30 days after mailing. In DuPage County, that is, traditionally they get it out on before May 1st, and the first installment is due June 1st. The second installment is the same day in September. Uh, unpaid bills, there is a collection system um, to ensure payment. Um, it's one of the places that, and we believe we, we have a collection of about 99.5%. Uh, so once we know what that extension or that collection amount is going to be, <coughs> we're, we're pretty much guaranteed that that's where it's going to end up at. As I said, the majority of our taxes, our majority of our revenue uh, and resources comes from local property taxes, about 78% of our budget. Um, our revenue for fiscal year 2020 is $73.6 million. Uh, and 78% of that, uh, 50 some odd million dollars, is uh, coming from property taxes. Uh, a large piece of that is residential. Our tax base is significantly residential, but we have a uh, decent amount, 16% of our revenue comes in from non-residential, commercial, industrial uh, property. We have a strong piece of that, and every time I drive up and down um, the extension of Belmont, when it goes Finley, I think, and see all of those 
um, warehouses going in, you know, those as they come on um, on as valuation, those help <coughs> bring in uh, taxes and, and help lower the burden on, on residential properties. Um, by the way, until they have occupancy, um, by and large, they're not they're not taxed or assessed. Uh, but those new property do come on, and we were able to get uh, to receive that piece. There are limitations to what we can increase from year to year. Um, in 1992, uh, General Assembly put through uh, what's called uh, PTEL, the Property Tax Extension Limitation Law, or tax caps as it's most commonly called. Uh, it limits a local unit of government's growth by consumer price index or inflation and whatever new property allows. It creates a limiting rate um, and limits the district to that. The county clerk applies those pieces and, and limits and reduces uh, the taxes down to those legal limits. The other thing it does is it limits uh, non-referendum debt uh, back to, to 1992. And prior to that, units of governments were allowed to issue bonds, issue debt, um, for non-referendum purposes for a certain amount, for certain things. Working cash, uh, health, life, safety, um, open revenue, there's a variety of pieces. S park districts, other, some municipalities did those things. School districts did them a little bit less. Um, the law put in place a cap um, a couple years after, the, after it went through and allowed for uh, this piece and it basically took that and froze it at that time and allowed it to grow annually by inflation, uh, by that CPI. Um, those districts who had a very small amount of that debt uh, are very limited long term. Now there are referendum questions to apply to put to increase that as you so wish, but it does limit it. Um, Downers Grove has a very small debt capacity, um, and now this is the principal and interest amount that cannot exceed $1.4 million a year. That is the debt that, <coughs> that threshold that we've allowed, we've used to borrow against to build the additions at Leicester. Uh, the district's done some capital improvements over the, over the years since uh, tax caps, uh, and most of your additions are based on those, those funds that we've done and, and issued. Um, but it is a small amount of money. Uh, other districts who had larger issuances when that law came into effect have greater abilities. The district that previously didn't have it up to understand $5 million annually that it could borrow, uh, which is a considerable amount of debt issuance. I believe in the three years we issued $30 million of work um, to, to be able to use that without having to ask a question. So um, it just happens to be an arbitrary date and time that they established that. And so that is also part of the limitation of the law. Um, one of the consumer price index um, for all urban goods, change from December to December is the big part of what we can grow each year. Um, this is going back from 2006 to 2019. Uh, this next year for the tax levy, it's 1.9%. Uh, it's been hovering around two. Right now, uh, this year, 20, 2019, uh, we won't know this number until December because of the change in December to December, I should say. Sorry, we don't know it until January for the 2020 levy. Um, but right now that number is hovering around 2, 2.1. So we may, hope, we may see um, some growth in that for the following year. I point out to 2008 where it came to be 0.1%. That year it was in the two and a half to three percent range up until the last 60 days of the year where we had the recession hit and everything stopped and so in november december from this actually from this point in time in october november december it slid down to that point one so it is a volatile piece depending on those circumstances Obviously, we've not had that since. Um, that I would just like to point those out as to anomalies in that system. We do average when we do a five-year. We look at five-year models. We average around two percent, one point nine to two percent, because it, 
that's about the that's what most people IMF uses. That's what uh, we look at as an average piece. <coughs> the district's very fortunate. It has a very large tax base, and has been growing um, considerably over the, over the period of time. Uh, about two point eight billion dollars in equalized assessed value. That's the total uh, tax base uh, that we levy against. Uh, last year we had twenty four million dollars. We're not in that $20 million range. 21 of that 24 is new construction in residential. And I think back in <coughs> June, um, when we put out the tax levy and some uh, real estate, you know, some information, we were looking at about a half a billion dollars in residential property growth, total growth, in the last uh, six, eight years, uh, something in that neighborhood. So we've had considerable amount of and considering that we don't have a lot of open track land, uh, that's all redevelopment pieces. Um, and so that has helped in allowing the district to increase above that, C that CPI number. Um, you can see that, but also since 2014, I'm gonna see if this works this way. Okay, it does work. I'm gonna go over. Is that working? That's not working. The, okay, well, let's go. The change in aggregate, if you look at what these numbers are here, that's essentially the growth of resident, of, of real property um, from year to year. From 2014 to 2018, that's a considerable amount of, in, of appreciation in property um, in that time uh, for the community. And so, um, that has also helped lower the tax rate. And since consumer price, you know, since we're limited by that CPI number and whatever new property gives us, and you have considerable appreciation of property, uh, our tax rate has, has decreased over that time. 2018 tax Tom, levy. Can you describing that in more detail? Why did the tax rate go down when property values increase? Because we're limited by the consumer price index and that new property number that we allow us to go up. And your, at best, that 1.9 or 2% plus a little bit extra on that piece, and your, grow, your aggregate is growing at 4.7, 6.1, 4.75, and 3.6. Overall, you we're limited as to how much we can grow in, in revenue, where that base is growing up higher. Um, obviously, individual properties do what individual properties do. If your appreciation is going up considerably comparative to your neighbors, you may see an increase in your bill overall. Um, if your property value is, is holding, our tax rate is going down, you may pay less. Um, but if, you know, it depends on what your growth overall is comparative to what our rate is. But our rate has continually decreased because we're limited by that, by that, by those other factors. Does that make sense? Did I? Correct. We don't, we don't assess taxes in a percentage. We assess them in a dollar amount. So if we put out a dollar amount, we're only able to increase that by CPI. If everybody's value goes up, that's a smaller percentage of the value of your home. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, the way it always helps for me is if, if the <laughs> rates go down, uh, or if the property value goes up, the rates go down. If the property value goes down, the rates go up. Because the government entity that's taxing has to capture the same amount of dollars each year plus CPI or new construction. So kind of a, a, a fulcrum if you want to think of it that way. And different than like income tax, right, where you have a, a flat, flat rate, rate. Right. We're, we're, we're actually every year growing our, our dollar amount by CPI. and so. Mm -hmm. The rates are then calculated by the, the assessor, uh, not not the other way around. So. Makes sense. <clears throat> Last year's request, uh, the levy request for tax for capped area was 57.2. We received uh, 56.17. Um, that tax rate was a dollar 96, dollar 97. Um, we have bonds outstanding, and that is about just under a nickel uh, per hundred dollars assessed value. So the total tax rate was 2.018. 2019 uh, proposed tax levy, um, 
is 58.73. We're at, and, and that's an increase, and, and we're looking at the capped area now, that's an increase of $1.5 million or 2.65% from the, in, the previous year's levy. It's up higher than the previous year extension, but from the levy to levy, it's about, it's a 2.65% increase. We're presenting it here as a rate because it's easier to talk about it as a rate on the overall levy, but what you're sharing is that each property is taxed at a certain dollar amount plus CPI. We look at aggregate yes, overall. Yes, this is the aggregate rate right. of the total levy. The individual property parcel, depending on what it does comparative in value increase to the overall, will depend exemption and so forth uh, will depend on what that that bill will go up or down Makes sense. so um, but essentially we and we are a very I mean we're comparatively a very low tax uh, rate district comparative to our neighbors in November we have a, a workshop coming and we'll talk a little more about some comparisons and looking at where we are uh, in local resources comparative to uh, neighboring districts and what we have available in tax base and then and, and, and so forth so uh, <coughs> that's all that's that's essentially the initial request piece uh, what you have next month is then uh, the approval of the certificate and, and, and we move forward with that um, it's a sort of it's a it's a somewhat simple process uh, in that we, we process this and go through this request piece uh, but it is a large amount of our revenue, obviously. Um, and, you know, our, our big piece is to make sure we get it all in uh, and certainly file to the county clerk for the last Tuesday in December. So, questions on that? I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up is the communications. Listed on tonight's agenda are six communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Okay. Let's move on to reports from the board. We'll start off with the superintendent report. Thank you. Um, just a couple of updates. It's that time of year. It's hard to believe that we're halfway through October, but for curriculum and instruction, uh, the results from last year's Illinois Assessment of Readiness, or IAR, formerly the Park Test, formerly ISAT, gets released on October 30th. Um, we are under embargo from the state, so while we do have data that's available to us as an administrative team, we cannot release that public until October 30th at 12 p.m. When that happens, uh, Mr. Sissel, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, along with each building principal, will be sending out notes and, uh, or excuse me, letters to um, every household in, the, in our schools and explaining how each one of their schools scored. And then Mr. Sissel and each building principal will also then follow up with parent forums so they can learn more about uh, the individual results. All of those are scheduled and have been shared out with each building. So thank you, Justin, for that effort. Um, as always, we are extremely proud of the hard work that our students and staff um, do on a daily basis. And uh, again, we're, we're very proud of the results for our schools. Uh, finance, uh, later on, the Health and Wellness Committee, uh, or excuse me, uh, Todd will be presenting uh, some information on insurance and rates later on. But also, there's another spotlight at the November meeting for health and wellness. So if board members have questions about some of the things they'd like to learn about the committee, I know we've done some work on that, but please let me know so we can incorporate that into the upcoming presentation. Uh, the facilities update, the district's excited about the possibility of securing a community engagement consultant this evening. So that'll be uh, on the agenda. I know we've been talking about that for a, a very long time. So there's a, obviously a lot of facilities work that needs to be done in our school district, and we're excited to move the ball forward in that area. Um, public relations. So one of the things we'd like to highlight uh, for public relations um, is that all schools are now sending out a weekly newsletter. That was different from years past, and, and so one of the things we're really trying to do is to highlight all the good things that are going on in our schools, make information more easily available for our families, and so each school is sending out a weekly consistent newsletter 
so that everyone gets the same experience throughout the school district. So that was a big piece of our strategic plan. So I want to thank our building leaders and Megan Hewitt for a really nice job with that. Um, also, in the area of public relations, one of the things that we want to highlight is October is uh, Principal Appreciation uh, Month. And it's coming up here throughout the entire month, but at the end, October 25th is the, is the big day. So we'd like to use this opportunity uh, with the board president to read a proclamation for our principals and other building leaders, including assistant principals and directors. Thank you. Uh, we do have here an official proclamation from the governor. And uh, it says, whereas student principals play an integral role in education and growth of children in elementary, middle, and secondary schools across the state of Illinois, and whereas school principals are responsible for promoting education and building relationships with parents and teachers to ensure each child receives services that meet their needs to excel in the classroom, and whereas it is a primary responsibility of the state of Illinois to preserve and improve resources for schools so that all students have access to quality education and a foundation for a successful future, and whereas the Illinois Principals Association, which represents over 5,300 educational leaders statewide, believes learning is a lifelong process and an education of our children is the highest priority, and whereas for the reason the Illinois Principals Association is dedicated to developing, supporting, and advocating for innovative school leaders. And whereas educational leaders face many challenges in supporting and educating our young people, and it is through their perseverance and passion, Illinois continues to produce quality, career-ready students. And whereas we must continue to encourage, support, and recognize those who have a positive impact on Illinois students and the educational system in the land of Lincoln, Therefore, I, J.B. Pritzker, Governor of the State of Illinois, do hereby proclaim the week of October 20th through the 26th of 2019 as Principals Week and February, October 20, uh, Friday, October 25th of 2019 as Principals Day in Illinois to recognize principals and the Illinois Principals Association for all they do to help our children learn and succeed. So thank you for all of your hard work. We're very proud of our building principals, so if you get the opportunity during the month of October, really any day, uh, please stop by to uh, thank all of our building leaders for all the hard work they do on behalf of our staff members and, of course, our students. So, again, thank you to our building leaders. Uh, in the area of technology, one of the things that we'd like to highlight is the District Seesaw Initiative. Um, we've been very successful this year touch points with all of our parents, making sure that we get those. Um, I, I'm also a, a parent of, of children who use Seesaw. It's a great tool to really view your child's portfolio of work. So Dr. Eichmiller has been working very hard with our building principals and our teachers. It is uh, more work for our teachers, but it definitely is worth it. So I want to thank all of our teachers for their hard work because there's nothing better as a parent when you can log in and see all the results uh, uh, of your child's learning throughout the year. So again, thank you very much for the hard work that's gone into Seesaw. Just some others, I um, want to thank all of our parents and teachers for the work they've done uh, this week with parent-teacher conferences. Um, our sign-up has been great. Our goal is to meet with every family uh, during the fall conferences, and, and we're well on our way toward that goal. So again, thank you to our teachers and uh, all of our parents for making sure that we take the time uh, to communicate about children and their academic success and achievement. <clears throat> also want to highlight our, our PTAs. Um, I have been, and I'll use this term, blown away at the support of our PTAs. And, and Puffer did a great job with that tonight, uh, Whittier previously. I've had the opportunity to attend several fundraising events that help enhance our curriculum. And I just want our PTAs and on behalf of our school board to know that that hard work does not go unnoticed. And um, it is very much appreciated for the difference that you're making in the lives of our children. So I know we have PTA members in the audience, but thank you for all the hard work that's not only taken place at the beginning of this year, but previous years and all the work that you've got scheduled uh, for the upcoming year. It is very much appreciated. Um, on that note, I'd also like to thank our Education Foundation. Um, if you had the chance to be in downtown Downers Grove uh, for Oktoberfest, it was quite uh, a production that they put on. Um, and I'd also like to thank the volunteers. We had board members, staff members, community members who volunteered. It is a 100% volunteer event. And all that money comes directly back to enhancing what goes on in the classrooms in District 58. So on behalf of the Board of Education, we would like to thank our wonderful Education Foundation of District 58. Their work they do is amazing. And to pull off an event like Oktoberfest, um, if you haven't had a chance to see just the, the bigness of that event, I know that's not a very scientific word, but um, it was, uh, it, it's pretty amazing what they do. So we definitely want to thank them for all of that hard work. Some upcoming events that we have, we have a curriculum workshop at Whittier School on October 28th. Um, November 4th, we have a Superintendent's Advisory Committee at Longfellow. 
And then November 11th on Veterans Day is our next Board of Education uh, meeting. That concludes my superintendent's report. Thank you. Any question? Well, with that, we'll move on to the monthly business report with Todd Drayfall. Welcome back. Thank you. I think it's your meeting tonight, Todd. I feel <laughs> Uh, be that there are some other items to discuss, um, <laughs> I will make this short. Uh, you have your year-to-date report out um, as of the end of September. Um, things are going along as expected. Um, yeah, we're at, 20, at the end of the first quarter. Um, expenses are as you know in line with, with projections and where we've been in the last several years as a percent of budget and as well as dollar amounts uh, revenue is coming in. The one piece I'll add, and it, it's in the memo uh, attached, is um, mid-year last year, uh, the board had asked for an update as far as where state revenue is. Um, we will start that report hopefully next month. Um, once we have enough data as to what we expect to get from the state in certain things, as well as some of the federal grants and where we are tracking uh, um, against those amounts. Um, we go and pull that report from the state, and there's some things that still aren't yet posted out on the on that system, and waiting to get those final what the budget amounts will be, and then where we're at against it. But we do have funds coming in from those. Um, we are, you know, uh, at where we are. Uh, one of the things we look at is um, the cash flow, and we are fifteen thousand dollars to the good comparative to the prior year. Um, and a little ahead of the four-year average. Uh, and that's, you know, one piece is a concern is we always look at that because we need to be growing fund balance uh, because our expenses grow up and that's, and that's the next piece. And we've been talking about a, a fund balance policy piece and that's something we'll be working with the FAC the next month mm -hmm. and bringing forward the board as we work through that piece as well. Other than that, um, do you have a couple items uh, on the agenda, some resolutions for approved uh, PFM, uh, Illinois Trust, which is something that's gone through the FAC uh, as an additional place to do some investments with that has a higher rate of return than uh, other um, firms that we're currently using, as well as an agreement to work with uh, Highland School. Um, I'm sorry, Highland School and the, the church next door. Um, that solidifies agreement that we've had informally with the prior, prior church that was there, um, new new uh, new owner there, and, and working through in that, making sure that we have all the liabilities and the legal piece worked out. So, there are questions. No, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, under our committee reports, we'll go ahead and start with the policy committee with Jill Samanti. <laughs> um, I'm kind of kind of put both of them together. The first thing is we have two policies up for first reading tonight, um, citizen communication and determining agenda. Um, and we recommend that uh, we approve those for final vote in November. Um, the second is the committee recommends that uh, it was brought up to us by Dr. Russell and just bringing in new ideas and things that we may not have known existed or otherwise. Um, we, again, as a committee, are recommending that the district adopts the Illinois Association for School Board Press Plus Policy Manual Updating Services. So what that is, is an automated, so we get Press Plus, right? Um, it will be online. And as legislation is passed or updates are made, um, it automatically does that. And if there's certain things that need to be approved by the board, it would be then set, sent to us and we would approve it. But as far as um, things that would be a benefit would be that District 58 and 99 would have the same policy, so it would be a pre-K or, or a kindergarten through 12 <coughs> with families dealing with the same policies. Um, it, Updates would occur in a timely manner. If there is a lag between when legislation is passed and we adopt it, um, law would take Supersedia. Uh, precedent. Um, 
The other thing is it also includes procedures for each of the policies, which then would be available to all school building administration. So right there we have an equity of one lice policy, one visitor to the schools policy. Um, everything is then consistent. Um, the other is that it does have a search engine, so the way that it is set up, parents looking for things would actually be able to find them in a very quick and timely manner. Um, all the policies also have all of the legal, legal references, um, and those are updated as they change, again, all automatically. So um, one of the negatives would be a cost associated. Uh, there would be a one-time fee um, associated with that. Right now, it would be $7,800 plus um, an annual fee after that of $2,500. Uh, but after talking as a group, um, that would probably end up saving uh, money in the long run because it would take a lot of time and money out of legal counsel since they charge a lot more than everyone. Um, so that actually turns into a positive, but we do like our legal, our legal, legal people. Um, so it kind of is a win-win. Um, the building and program administrators that are on the committee um, were all for it. Uh, parents, uh, the board member, Dr. Russell. So the idea would be to um, talk to press, press. For the press plus policy updating services talk to them about what we'd look like we would we would start in the summer and use the next school year to break into committees figure out exactly what things needed to be again we can change the policies to reflect the uniqueness of Downers Grove 58 um, so there it's not that it's just cut and dried um, and then it would go then back to um, IASB and then back to the committee for adoption we would post it um, and then it would become to the board so again as a committee we've talked for two months about the, the the pros of this and so we as a committee are recommending that we move forward with this any questions no. I, I, I'm wondering for uh, Everything you shared generally makes sense, and uh, it's great to move in that direction, it seems. Uh, should we, if we start to move towards this in the summer, mm -hmm. should we expect a large wave of changes up front and budget time in our board approval process and reading process in that first few months of like, there's gonna be a significant amount of change, because right now we've been pacing it. Correct. On how much we can reasonably handle over the course of a month, over the months. Right. Should we expect that way? Yeah, and, and so, Jill, if, I, if you don't mind, if I can Absolutely. just jump in. Um, one point of clarification. I think what we were looking to do is to um, bring this whole concept for formal approval at the November 11th meeting. At that meeting, we would have the cost structure laid out in a memo format so the board knew exactly what was coming down the pipe. The way this process works is then we could actually start this process um, throughout this school year and then have the discussion about when we wanted to implement it this summer. So. The way it works in general is the committee or subcommittees of the committee meet with uh, representatives from the Illinois Association of School Boards. It, it's a four meeting process and you go through your current board manual, which most of which is aligned with press, and then we go through the press, what I call the generic manual. So we don't lose any of that unique language that we want in our policies. But Karat, you are right. Um, one of the things that we will have to discuss as a board is the board is going to, rather than just approve one or two policies, you're going to be approving the entire package, so to speak. So there's eight sections in the policy manual, and it's significantly longer than, than the current policy manual. If anybody wants to get a, a sense of what that looks like, if you go to District 99 and you go on their board tab, um, you know, you can see all their policies. That's exactly what we'll have, and, and quite frankly, what most districts have out there. Um, I've been through this process before. We uh, had to schedule one extra meeting, and it was specifically designed around the policy manual, and, and we were able to get through that. Many of the policies that um, are included in the press are um, 
just important to have legally. I wouldn't consider them necessarily controversial, but it's just a good thing to have. So you tend to only focus on maybe one or two policies per section, but you are going to have to, in my view, uh, more than likely as a Board of Education, schedule one additional meeting, which can certainly take place in the summer, or maybe on a lighter evening in the summer, we could put this on there. I, I think the committee, as Joe pointed out, was, was hesitant to do something middle of the school year and, and have parents on you know, two separate policy manuals and staff. So we'd be looking for that implementation after the summer, um, starting next school year. So, so my guess is we would need maybe one meeting or during a lighter meeting over the summer, we could focus primarily on this and, and get through it. Another plus is we are one of the only school districts that hasn't done this. So we would be jumping on the good old bandwagon to make life easier for everyone. I commend the, the work of the previous policy committees because I, I don't think the district is, is in jeopardy at this particular point. Um, it's just a lot of work to do this on your own when you have the expertise of the Illinois Association of School Boards. So one thing I, I do want to make clear to the public the district is in a, isn't in a spot that's not legally compliant. This puts you in a, just a much stronger position um, in case something were to happen or um, if new laws come into place where you're able to adjust to them much more quickly and then have the experts from the Illinois Association of School Boards. So what that looks like, they, they call their, their, their service press. Press is comprised of several leading attorneys from the various law firms across the state of Illinois that all contribute to these policies. Um, so as a board, you don't necessarily adopt all of the recommendations. You're reading through them and going through the same work that you would have previously done on the policy committee. <laughs> Any other Thank questions? You. Perfect. Thank you. Well then, is there a motion to approve for first reading policies a 1150 citizens communication to the board and 8244 determining agenda and place them on the November board agenda for final approval. Need a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? We'll discuss this next month. Correct. Yeah, this is just this just is for first sure reading. Yep. For first reading. Yep. All right. Then all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve for first reading policies 1150 citizen communication to the board and 8244 determining agenda and place them on the November board agenda for final approval. Next up is the legislative committee. Uh, Karato, she will report. All right, thank you. So uh, the legislative committee had a chance to meet for our first meeting of the year last Wednesday. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit of uh, about what that committee structure is and what, why we exist. Uh, this is the 29th year that that committee is in, in session. Uh, it's a uh, one of the one of the four board committees, and uh, the mission of the committee is to assess existing and proposed state and federal education legislation, impact and promote legislation in support of District 58, and communicate vital information to our school community. Um, there are a couple of anchoring uh, activities that the legislative committee does on an annual basis. Uh, first is uh, when, uh, when the Triple I conference, uh, which uh, for our school boards is our lobbying organization, the uh, IASB, the Illinois Association of School Boards, uh, holds a conference in uh, November. Uh, they also convene the delegate assembly. And that delegate assembly is uh, asked uh, to come to the floor, in essence. Uh, it's one vote per school district, or one vote per member school district of the IASB. And the IASB being our lobbying organization, our, as a board, the lobbying organization, uh, is asking for the delegates to tell them what position do you want us to take in lobbying for you on your behalf down in Springfield. And so uh, the legislative committee takes on the activity each year of reviewing the proposed amendments of member school districts or proposed positions of members from the member school districts and then does an up-down vote on do we agree with that position or do we disagree with that position. Ultimately, the IASB takes that direction and then goes to lobby on behalf of whatever that vote turns out to be. Um, and so uh, I'll dive into that in, uh, in a bit, uh, in a bit more detail. The other major activity we do is to advocate for legislation. And so the way that we choose to do that is by uh, bringing our legislators to the table as part of a legislative breakfast in the winter-spring time frame every year. 
Um, it has now become an annual tradition uh, hosted by District 58 uh, and where we welcome neighboring districts and their leaders to join us to also welcome our legislators and talk about policies that are top of mind and hot topics of, uh, of the legislative agenda at that moment. Those are the two anchoring events uh, or activities of this committee. Uh, right now, is the, the time in the season is focused on what we want the District 58 vote to be on proposals that uh, the our lobbying organization will ultimately uh, vote for on our behalf. And so um, today I'll just do a share out, and Emily, please chime in if there's anything that I miss. Uh, I'll do a share out of where we are in the process and the process that we go through as, leg as a legislative committee. Uh, in November, we will actually, as a school board, discuss the, this year there are 18 proposals on positions we should be taking, either in support or uh, in opposition. We will discuss those. Uh, we will all have that as pre-reading uh, to be able to know and coming into this ones that we want to make sure we dive into uh, during our, our time together in open session. Uh, but I'll just walk through uh, some of the key things that we dove into last week. Um, there are, as I said, 18 items to uh, discuss and vote on. Uh, they fall into a number of categories. The ones that we focused on last week were on around student safety, um, around uh, school board terms and compensation and on prevailing wage. Uh, there are six other topics that are up for a discussion in, in the proposals. Uh, special education funding is one. Uh, trauma responsive practices in our, in our educational and curriculum content. Background checks, business contracts, state authorized charter schools, and state assessments. These are all topics that are up for debate uh, and discussion. We had a chance to uh, dig in as a legislative committee on about six, uh, six out of the 18. Um, and we had some very real discussions. Some we had very real discussions and we tended to, the majority of the group tended to agree. There are some that we had very real discussions and we were not able to get to a very clear resolution on how uh, the legislative committee would ultimately recommend to this board on how we should vote as a district. There were a number that we did not get to. We prioritized our times, the one that we felt, the ones that we felt would be either controversial or would be inappropriate for the school administrative team to weigh in on and provide a recommendation. Uh, as an example of that latter one is whether school board should be school board members, seven of us, should be compensated. Uh, it felt inappropriate for Dr. Russell and his team, given that we manage them, uh, to recommend whether we or should or should not be compensated. And so we had a very uh, a very good discussion about that and we'll discuss that among the other uh, 17 proposals uh, next month uh, as part of our discussion items. Um, but that was one that we, we saved for the committee to make a recommendation on, among a few others. The ones that we did not get to, that we also feel aren't necessarily as controversial, but we do want to make sure we get to a formal recommendation. We asked Dr. Russell and his team to ultimately review them and provide a recommendation to this board as part of our pre-reading next month, uh, and so that we can come in. Uh, and the way that we'll structure it next month, most likely, is I'll ask this group to put up for discussion a few items that we want to make sure that you were, it was important for you to make sure we discussed or you felt like you disagreed with the recommendation of the committee or the administration. Um, but we won't discuss all 18, we'll discuss the ones that are most important. Uh, any questions about uh, that process or the legislative committee's process for the year? I, just, mm -hmm. I do have one question. Yeah. Looking at the upcoming stuff, you don't have a meeting prior to our next board meeting. Right. Are, are you guys going to try to get together before the next board meeting, or? Right. Yeah, it's a good question. The ones that we felt most were most important, and might honestly felt like we uh, would have disagreement on, we got to. Okay. And so we didn't feel the need to. Uh, we did a check on uh, on the committee. And we didn't feel the need to con reconvene on the items that we didn't get to. We felt comfortable with, with uh, asking the administration to give us a recommendation. So we'll just have a, a memo then come from the administration on the kind of our full stance on it, so we can have a. A larger discussion about that. Yeah, right. I think uh, Dr. Russell might be helpful for us to name the ones that were settled as part of the legislative committee, mm -hmm. and the ones that we didn't get to that you are now proposing as a recommendation from your team. Well, I thought about setting it up, and, and, and please, you know, provide feedback, uh, almost like a consent agenda, where we would lay out all the 18 proposals, and lay out uh, first the ones that the committee were or was able to discuss in the committee's recommendation, and then the ones that the administration reviewed in our recommendation. And the reason I would put forward in, in a consent agenda is just like a regular consent agenda, if there are ones that any board member would like to pull off for further discussion, 
you can do that. Um, if you don't want to pull any off for discussion, then there's there's no need, and you would just take the recommendation. But I, I'm thinking just time-wise at the next meeting, given everything that, that that's on there, that might be the best way to go. Mm -hmm. um, but still allow all individual members to have that ability to pull one or two or three off should they want to discuss those. How does that format sound? Um, based on my understanding of it, that, that makes it perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just allows us not to have to have 18 motions and seconds and Absolutely. votes, right? Yeah. You know, so, but while we'll still have published, the only thing I would ask is, is the timeline in, in getting that data to the, the, the full board um, just giving us ample time to make sure we've had an opportunity to review that mm -hmm. and, and reach out either to, to you or, or to the administration to get clarity so that um, we don't have to break it out into 18 uh, individual um, votes. I think yeah, one of the things the that, that we could certainly do as the administration is get that to you in our recommendations in one of our weekly updates, uh, you know, at least a week ahead of time so that you could have time during that week instead of just a quick turnaround with the, you know, the board book being right. posted and then. So I think what you're saying is, is there a way to get that out of a, a, about a week ahead of time? We certainly can do that. That would be a preference, yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Other questions? No, thank you. Uh, the Financial Advisory Committee did not meet since the last board meeting, neither did the district leadership team. Um, the Health and Wellness Committee did, and the report will be done by Greg Harris. Thanks, Darren. So the October 9th meeting of the Health and Wellness Committee was uh, a week ago today, and it came on the heels of our, our October 7th special board meeting when we listened to a presentation from Mr. Dre Fall and Mike Baker from Group Alternatives about the data that goes into um, that informs a recommendation to the Board of Education for premium increases to all of our health insurance plans. Um, a central topic of conversation during this meeting of the Health and Wellness Committee um, was the process uh, of how those recommendations are, 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 um, are generated. Um, the, the recommendation comes from the board, or comes to the board, the board ha makes that decision, but the, the process of how that, the, the um, how, um, how that's come, how it's, we arrive at that decision was, was what we discussed. Um, and particularly what role that committee plays in determining that recommendation. Um, it seemed after um, Monday's meeting that there was, um, um, it seems like the, the Board of Education and the associations had after that Monday meeting uh, maybe some different understandings of what that process looked like, but I think we had we were able to have a really um, healthy and frank conversation um, through which both sides were able to, um, to understand and appreciate each other's perspectives. Um, what I stressed to our unions was that um, this board is very much committed to having meaningful partnerships uh, with them and that um, our preferred route for handling such issues in the future is through open, honest, and transparent communication. Um, I feel like the, the meeting ended quite positively, and I think it was a great framework for handling um, future uh, misunderstandings and conflicts amicably. Um, the committee's decision um, was to keep the recommendation at 6.4% for all the plans except for the high deductible plan. Uh, this is due to a lack of credible data um, deriving from uh, the newly created HSA plan. Um, this, this recommendation is endorsed by our business office and group alternatives. Um, it was discussed by the committee, um, some commitments for future recommendations to the Board of Education. Um, they will look differently once we have reached a point where we have credible data that allows us to make more informed decisions. Um, at that time, recommendations uh, um, from, to the Board of Education will have premium increases um, or frankly possibly decreases that are determined through um, the incorporation of analysis of the performance of each plan individually um, from the previous year. So these decisions will take into account market trend data provided to us from group alternatives so that we're always relying on the, the input of experts uh, when we, um, the experts that we contract with to guide us through this process. Um, in addition to navigating that, we, um, the committee also talked about um, plans for educating employees um, and there are dates set for having some informational meetings for um, indiv individual plan designs and how that might impact employee A's family versus employee B's family. Um, employee education is important to um, the group 
and it's going to be a topic of each of our future meetings, um, things to be discussed, um, things that we want to get out to members is um, how to be a good healthcare consumer, um, voluntary life insurance, the Aetna app, upcoming wellness screenings, and potential prescription drug savings. Um, Todd or Jane, anything to add? Obviously, go ahead. I have a question about the education process. Mm -hmm. If uh, I am a consumer of healthcare, so I will say from a consumer's perspective, for for me, what I'd be interested in knowing is if I was to put in my family situation, and I was able to say, here's my out-of-pocket cost in Plan A, here's my out-of-pocket cost in Plan B, here are the risks I take with Plan A, here are the risks I take with Plan B, here are the benefits I get from Plan A, here are the benefits I get from Plan B. If, it, it feels like a very straightforward calculation that, to be perfectly honest, I just don't go through because the health plans that I have offered to me, there isn't a great alternative. We provide four alternatives to our employees, and so the education process seems to be more important because there are actual re very reasonable choices. Um, I'd be interested to know what is it that the, like, what does that education process look like, and how transparent is it and easy to engage with is it? If we can see it or if we can feel it, I'd like to make sure that when we are the administrators, we are not, I don't know if any of us are well versed in insurance administration, but we are the administration, administrators of a health insurance plan. And we are also ultimately responsible for accurately and appropriately educating our constituents. And so for that purpose, what does that education plan look like? And I just have to understand it or possibly even see it. I'm happy to jump in. I was just going to say, like, um, no, go ahead. Um, so this year it's going to look much different. I think one of the things with the help of all of our associations and the staff and in, in the board in the health and wellness committee, um, there was great discussion. I, I would say, and this is not a slight against anything that's happened in the past, it was more um, the information is available should you want to seek it. Um, you know, whether it's a video online or whether you can click on the import, uh, employee portal and, and read it. But one of the things that we had discussed a couple weeks ago was just the average time people use to research the health care decisions that they make. And that was kind of a number that really stuck out. Uh, I know that did for me at the last meeting. Um, so we went back to the committee members, uh, not only during the committee, but you know, before and after the committee, and really researched that and said, how do we get this to a spot where we can, um, during um, times when all of our employees together, not passively, um, you know, look it up on the computer, but how can we get that information in front of our employees, you know, administrators, teachers, support staff, so everyone can make the most informed decision and be educated about these plans? Because, you know, we, we throw our terms like HSA or PPO or high deductible, and, and a lot of that becomes very um, scary to people because it's just not something they're, they're that familiar with. So the education piece to me is, is um, a non negotiable and it's something very important. So um, this year, we are going to be providing those opportunities for our staff, uh, starting on the 21st for our instructional assistants, then the 28th for our teachers, uh, November 1st, I believe, is for our preschool teachers, and then November 4th is going to be for our custodial staff and our secretarial staff. And I think I have all those dates wrong, but I may have mixed one, one or two up. Um, but we are going to be bringing in group alternatives and educating our staff on those pieces and so they are going to be able to not only um, sit through a presentation on what those look like but have an ability to ask questions and then have time to go back and look at some of those numbers and that data before they make that open enrollment decision for themselves or, or, or for their family. The other piece that we are talking about doing is as we onboard new employees to the school district, um, what process do we have to educate those people in, in terms of because they don't always have that big educational opportunity like we're talking about setting up with all of our other staff. So um, we are going to be taking <coughs> these and when our, we hire new employees, we're talking about what's the process. Do we have them watch a video and then have someone from the personnel department sit down with them or someone from the business department? So we're working through that for new employees. But for existing employees, the biggest difference I think you're going to see this year um, is that we are going to be educating our staff why they are here versus asking them to do that at a time where they might not be able to get to that. Did that answer your, your question? I heard the process. I didn't see the content, yeah. right? So, and I didn't expect you to have the content ready. I'd love to be able to 
put my like parent hat on sure. or my taxpayer hat on and say, or my consumer hat on and say, would this content be something that I could actually find approachable versus glaze over? So one of the things that Mike Baker had mentioned at the Monday uh, special board meeting that we had is that Group Alternatives is, is very good. They've got a lot of practice in this, in delivering that instructional content. One of the things we can do for the Board of Education is we are going to be videotaping at least one of these uh, sessions where we can make it available. Because I think it'd be important to get your feedback, as, especially in year one, as we you know, try and really double down on this. You know, what, what did you feel about that video? Did it help answer your questions as kind of the overall administrators of this? But um, the confidence that we have um, with Group Alternatives what, one of the things they stress with us is we just have to get the people in front of us and then we can really do a nice job educating them on the individual plans. Of course, I can't necessarily speak to you know, what slide two will look like versus slide four, but it is a lot of taking um, individuals in their situation and explaining the difference for these plans and how these plans would work. Um, so I have confidence in group alternatives based on everything that we've seen with our educational piece, but we can certainly let the board and, and, and the public for that matter see what we're doing in these individual uh, sessions. So that is something that we can share with the board ahead of our, our next meeting. I'm assuming we can turn that around because we are going to be talking about health and wellness and it would be nice to get some um, feedback on the educational process so we can continue to fine tune this uh, for future years and for new employees as we onboard them. Thanks. Don't underestimate how riveting that information can be. So, uh, the more riveting, the better. <laughs> and, and thank you for regathering the troops. I know this, this transition that we're moving to can be a bit confusing as we're moving to a model where funding is based uh, on premiums and uh, making sure that we have this properly funded through the end of next calendar year. Uh, it's just a real priority. I know to this board, there, there, there's a lot of concern. I know when we looked at the budgets alone that we were entering, you know, we were right there on that precipice of being in a deficit spend, and we want to make sure that, that we're properly getting um, the MRF funded so that we know that we can provide the level of service that, that, that our employees need. So, so thank you for, for gathering the troops, and thank you for, I, I see a couple of people that I know were, were, were there, so thank you for taking the time uh, to do that. Any other questions? Okay. But with that, we have no discussion items uh, this month, so we'll move on to our receptions of visitors. This is an opportunity of members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Uh, criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment. Um, this evening, we encourage you to keep your comments to a three-minute limit to allow everyone a chance to speak. At this time, it looks like we've received a one card. Um, so we ask that, uh, so we'll just start, we'll, we'll go ahead and start with you, Andy. <laughs> Good evening. First of all, my name is Angie Robarzik. I'm the president of the Downers Grove uh, Custodial Maintenance Association. I know most of you. I, First of all, I want to say Happy Bosses Day. <laughs> um, the reason I came tonight is I wanted to thank you for being open to work with us, uh, the Health and Wellness Committee, I sit on that. And we're trying really hard to make things work. It's a long process, but our administration team has been wonderful through it. Uh, very supportive and we're trying to do the right thing. We realize how much health insurance costs. Uh, we realize we have some good plans and we're really trying to educate all our members as much as we can. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback of people that are interested in learning more so I think that's a really good start. So thank you. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for respecting us and keeping us in the loop with everything. It's really important. Um, it shows a family unit, and it makes you feel really good about working for the district. I want you to know that. I also want to thank you. Um, the new board, can, you know, thanks for being there, our board. I haven't gotten to be here since you have gotten elected, so thank you. It's been really nice working with, once again, you have done a wonderful job since you have been here, and our, you have a wonderful administration team underneath you. And thank you very much for hiring Dr. Russell because um, everybody has, and there was nothing wrong with us as a group before, but we've 
bonded together a lot closer and everybody has been on the same page and it's been great. It's been a great start of the school year and real positive and everything is going in the right direction as far as we're concerned. So thank you and I just wanted to say that. So thank you. have a nice thank, evening. Thank you. Thanks Angie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this is a big undertaking and um, I know is. it's taken a while for everybody to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're taking care of stuff. So I, I thank you for the comments. But you have, honestly, you have a wonderful administration team and uh, very open and very positive and always willing to hear feedback. So that's great. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. All right. Then um, at this time, we will now open it up. If you did not fill out a card, we'd welcome you to come up and speak. Just please state uh, your name and attendance area before you speak. All right. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and skip right over recess and we'll, uh, go to, uh, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the September 9th, 2019 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from the September 9th, 2019 meeting as presented. <clears throat> Next, we move on to our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to, a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of a list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right. Uh, we've got a couple items up for action tonight. The first one is the medical insurance rates. Is there a motion to approve the rate increases as presented in the attached memo and increase the district contribution to the HSA, uh, $250 for single coverage and $500 for the family coverage for the upcoming year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yep. I assume there's going to be a lot of discussion on this. I will, I will chime in on our discussion. Okay, go ahead. Um, the recommendation here makes sense to me because we don't have we have one plan that has a significant portion of our uh, employees and then every every other plan is 20 employees or less approximately um, and from mike's report it sounds like that is not the tipping point right that is not enough employees to have enough data to be able to get a signal on whether the rates are appropriate um, i also uh, understand that this proposal of 6.4 percent gets us at a deficit neutral or a zero deficit insurance plan based on the projections. Uh, and so that makes sense. Uh, I, I shared with uh, a couple of folks, I shared with Dr. Russell, uh, my target is that we always aim for a zero, def uh, zero deficit uh, proposal. And so rely heavily on the projections and ultimately that, that projection gets us to zero dollars deficit. Um, what, I don't know, uh, what I don't know is um, when do we reach the tipping point and like, we're not the first to run a health care plan, so what, what number of employees do we need to reach a tipping point um, and uh, versus like a time frame, which I think I saw in the proposal, but like more so a like what number of employees do we need? So do we have a, a number on that or an estimate? Yeah, and I, I'm going to just based off what uh, group alternatives share with us, um, and, and I'm going to give you a wide range because they said 40, 40. to 100. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the closer you get to 100, the more viable the, the plan becomes. Uh, but I will let Todd chime in because I know we've had, we've had conversations. And the, the other thing, is it's not just not having enough members to generate reliable data. It's also the, the plan has only existed for eight months. Mm -hmm. So we don't have enough historical data to, to, to make a, um, you know, an informed assessment. Yes, I mean, uh, the insurance, we have a third, because we're self-insured, we have a third party uh, administrator, which is Aetna for us, um, but they're insurance companies. And depending on the insurance company, and, and I think things have changed now, even, I mean, over the years, the economies of this all has changed. But some companies will say upwards closer to 100, 
Uh, some will say the minimum is 40. I think Blue Cross always had, you know, uh, that I work, when I worked with, always needed 40 to start uh, to have a, a, a credible, and the, the idea is a credible number. Um, certainly with the HSA, because of the structure, uh, you know, a longer period to make sure um, once people start hitting the deductibles or the maximum out of pockets, and then the plan is absorbing costs, you know, you get a 12 month uh, window into that piece to see where that's at. So it's a combination of both. I mean, obviously, you know, we're going to do a, a very active and hopefully really uh, authority, uh, a good attempt to get an educational piece. Uh, we did a, a pretty good uh, format last year uh, without carving out time within, you know, uh, within the, the day piece that, that we're going to be able to do this year. Uh, and we had 20 people. We now have 20 people also to help sell that plan. So I think we're going to be in a much different position. I mean, our, our plan is our hope and our projection is to be in a much different position uh, 12 months from now um, when we're coming back and looking at the, the next year uh, and talking this to you because we're going to have more than, hopefully more than double uh, in that HSA and certainly we'll have now then 18 months uh, of data to look at and, and throw up like that. That'll get us to two plans. If, if that all pans out, that'll get us to two plans that have uh, the ability to set rates at the individual plan level. What do we do about the other two plans in that scenario? The other two plans um, the redu are really not structured or suited for the majority of our employees. Um, the bronze plan or the, H the, the high deductible plan that is, uh, project is recommended at a zero increase is just that it is a plan uh, that we have we must we offer, offer right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. the other plan the, the reduced PPO plan also is a plan um, for in you know, employees that have a higher contribution level and a lower pay structure uh, that allows them for uh, you know a, a plan that has some that reduced benefits format um, but yet something that they can you know that they can afford so those plans truly will not likely be self self and you know, supportive but we do have history on those and so we're able to look at those and, and, and can, traditionally they have had where um where the contribute where, where the payouts on those pieces um i should say the the, the claims on them are, are below uh, the amount paid in um, simply because the individual has a larger liability uh, to cover. Uh, like the, the, the bronze plan is just an example, the high deductible plan, it's a $10,000 deductible. So, you know, before the plan is paying any large amount of money, uh, the individual is, is into it. Um, and that, you know, it's a catastrophic plan. Okay. The, the process that I'm trying to get to is take as much of the emotion and subjectivity out Absolutely. of this and right. put as much of the math and logic behind it because none of us want to be in this place where we feel like we are playing with something that's very personal to the individual and their benefits. Uh, it should really just be about the math and the benefit package that we negotiate during collective bargaining. And so uh, as much as we can define very clearly the process, which it seems like we're heading in that direction, uh, so I just wanted to make sure we're accelerating that direction. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, Karat, I know you expect a lot of discussion. I guess I'll just echo everything you said. Um, I, I think it needs to be uh, numbers driven, and I think uh, the main goal remains uh, not accepting a de deficit uh, target from, from day one, and, and we're not doing that in this case. So I think uh, we landed in a good spot. Okay. <coughs> um, and I'll just. Uh, follow up with some of the things that Greg said that um, you know two years ago I would not have thought that we could all sit in a room and and come to an actual decision without lots of, of stuff um, so I just wanted to thank everyone who's on the committee um, on both sides to listen to one another and really see the the big picture and the end goal and putting our kids first and part of that is making sure that we are taking care of our staff and making it a place that people want to work so thank you thank you Greg I, I agree with you Jill as somebody that's 
has sat on a lot of committees before. You're taking a lot of time out of your day and your family and whatnot. So I really appreciate all the work when you do bring back reports of, and I like the structure now where it's every month we're talking about it. So it's a dialogue, a regular continuing conversation as opposed to just a check the box once a year type of thing. So that's helpful to, for me and um, I appreciate everybody that's on that committee working towards the same goal. Great. Yeah, I would just kind of echo everything that everybody's already said. I think the committee's done a really, really good job of kind of bringing everybody together around an issue that has, has been sort of contentious in the past and I think we're, we're moving in the right direction now and we just need to kind of keep keep our eyes on that and, and um, you know like people said the the fiscal side of it is important but so is the human side and I think we need to just keep working on meshing those two things together and, and coming to a good you know a good compromise between all sides so I, I think everybody's doing a great job with that uh, one thing I did want to say is first of all I want to commend everybody that's sitting up here on the dais tonight for really taking the time and effort to to really try to understand the health insurance industry what what we're doing here is actually quite complicated and we're in the process of shifting it and, and changing some of the parameters around it so I know that when you guys look at, at the history of what's going there's so much history that got us to the place that we're at and so uh, I really just appreciate the questions that a lot of people have been asking of the administration or of myself to make sure that that they got up to speed on the issue uh, on, on all of this so so thank you uh, for doing that thank you for the administration for spending so much time on that I did want to bring up something that is just a general concern that I want us to keep our eye on and part of that we're going to do by um, not only looking at this monthly but kind of on a quarterly basis just looking at the health that's happening um, what our what what the income side is and what our expense side is on the different accounts make sure that that uh, this stuff is running uh, as as cleanly as possible uh, there's something I want to point out just because it is a very confusing process and that is that we're blending two um, financial um, mm -hmm. methods here in the fact that we as a budget run on a fiscal year and we are moving this into a calendar year and one of the challenges that I see reading this is that um, it was hard to, and I understand, because I, I, I took a chance to sit down with both Kevin and Todd before this meeting, but if you looked at that second memo that went out today, you'll notice that when they project sort of the, the, the low end, high end, sort of the, the, the health that we're going to reach at the end, that's at the end of the fiscal year, not at the end of the medical claims year. Um, we can't also forget that the stop loss uh, insurance that we have is on a different cycle then so this is going to be one of those challenging things that I think we're gonna have to look at and understanding the impact of this and making sure that this stays viable and that these plans are feasible is going to be a little bit of a challenge so we're showing that um, that is the fiscal year ends that we're unlike we're likely to hold a surplus uh, on this and that's a good place to be because we still have another six months that we have to to, to make it through um, we seem to have a lot of a belief from from both group alternatives and uh, from Todd and his team that that we'll be able to keep this at that zero marker that that Karat talked about but over these next couple month, months and over this year we're gonna hear a lot of numbers thrown around and there's gonna be a lot of the stock lost stuff. the fiscal year is gonna end we're gonna be budgeting for next year and figuring out a mid-year budget increase and in what that'll look like so I just encourage you guys to continue to ask questions continue to let me know if you have anything because I think this is that year where we're figuring it out and we got to make sure that we get this right so that um, we're not putting in ourselves a situation where we're putting too much of a burden on the staff or too much of a burden uh, on the district at any given point because we weren't prepared so um, thank you for all the work that went into that but just continue to keep keep an eye on that just be prepared for the fact that we're working in both a fiscal and a calendar year and um, and I I think we're just going to have to continue to, to educate ourselves on that. So I don't know if anyone has any questions on that, but um, if not, do you have any comments? No, no uh, just for the, the audience and, and for those um, who will view this at home, the fiscal year for schools runs July 1st through June 30th, and then the calendar year for our insurance, uh, which our insurance used to be based on the fiscal year, obviously goes January 1 through December 31st. So I want to echo what, what Darren said, and I know Todd would echo this too is that as we're really working very hard with, with the committee, and I want to thank Angie and all the other representatives because she's spot on. It, there's a lot of people who are very committed to this process, 
really looking at how we report that out quarterly to track these numbers and, and to make proper adjustments as we go through, I think is going to be essential. I also have been dealing with, with insurance rates since I've been a school administrator, and it is a very challenging thing to understand. It, there's a lot of moving parts, and, and so please, uh, you know, anyone on the board or in, in the community, should you have questions, don't hesitate to continue to reach out to us and, and, and reach out to the committee so we can educate ourselves together to make sure that we're making the, the best decisions okay and with that Melissa will you please go roll member Olchek aye member Samanti aye member Weiner aye member Doshi aye member Hannes aye member Harris aye Number Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the rate increases as presented in the attached memo and increase the district contribution to the ASA, uh, to the HSA, $250 for single coverage and $500 for family coverage for the upcoming year. Next, we have a resolution approving the declaration of trust of Illinois Trust, PFM, as a deposit, as a depository. Uh, this is recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution approving the declaration of Trust of Illinois Trust and authorizing the execution thereof and authorizing certain school officials to act on behalf of the Downers Grove Elementary School District 58? So moved. Second. Any discussion? This is a reminder, Todd mentioned this a little bit earlier. We talked about it last month's FAC meeting. This is just a, a, a new set of tools that we can use for, for investments. So, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution approving the declaration of trust of, of the Illinois Trust and authorizing the execution thereof and authorizing certain officials to act on behalf of the Downers Grove Elementary School District 58. Uh, next up is the approval of a third party consultant for S facility planning committee engagement. Is there a motion to approve the contract with, I'm assuming you should say Beyond Your Base? Beyond Your Base is the third party consultant for the facility planning committee engagement pending attorney review. So moved. Second. All right. Um, any discussion? I'll share that uh, we went through the process last time we met in a special meeting uh, to hear proposals from two uh, uh, two firms, uh, Beyond Your Base and Unicom Arc. Uh, and I felt like Beyond Your Base just had a, a better fit process and approach that uh, we need for District 58. Uh, uh, and uh, so from, from, from those two presentations, it felt like a stronger approach for how to honestly and, uh, and very clearly, with more clarity, engage the community um, on uh, on things that are tangible. There is a significant portion of our voter base, taxpayer base, that is not engaged in the schools on a regular basis, and rightfully so, depending on where they are in their life cycles. Um, and we need to be able to communicate with them in a way that's approachable. Mm -hmm. um, and their uh, beyond your basis approach of developing concrete plans, plan A and plan B and possibly even a plan C, made a lot of sense for me if I didn't, uh, a year ago I did not have kids in schools. Uh, and so at that moment, uh, if I wasn't on the school board, I probably would not have been very engaged in understanding what are these plans and what are these facilities and what are the needs. And so finding a very structured and clear way to talk to any voter, whether they are a parent or not, um, I, I really appreciated that. And so um, I felt like their proposal was just a better fit for us. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I agree that um, what Beyond Your Base offers seems to meet our needs better, and, and um, I think that the added benefit that Paul Hanley brings is that he knows our community, having worked with us before. Um, there, you know, we did discuss at length um, the potential appearance of a conflict of interest between him and White and Company, um, and I think I said at the last meeting that um, there, 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 there's a risk attached to that, but there's also a risk attached to not going with who we think is the best option and we think who is the person who is going to get us over the goal line. Uh, I think ARC would be a, um, a satisfactory um, uh, second place candidate um, who could help us with the work, but it's, it's not exactly what we need at this time. 
So I am willing, I don't even think I'm, I was just about to say I'm willing to roll the dice with Paul. I don't think it's rolling the dice. I am, I am um, really, really happy with um, the, the, um, the feedback we received from our, our legal counsel and the language that's be going to be added to this contract to um, put my, my nerves at ease related to the appearance of a potential conflict of interest. And I am um, fully in support of, of Beyond Your Base and I'm really excited to work with them. Yeah, and I want to thank everyone for their time. I know I kind of raised the flag and probably extended this this conversation. Um, maybe you know, kind of hindsight, maybe um, it drag out a little bit longer than needed. So I appreciate everyone's uh, time and, and patience when we have that discussion. Um, but I, I, I definitely agree. I think uh, going with beyond our base um, is is definitely the, the right way to go. And um, I, I think the the one thing that I really liked about that discussion the other day is uh, his team recognizes that we have a a very draft you know we always put draft in capital letters I, I think the fact that we, we, we can't emphasize that enough um, and I think to kind of use his terminology we don't even have that plan a established so I think um, I think we need to open our eyes um, to, to that fact um, um, and I think the the fact that he kind of used the the term the, the draft is ridiculous um, I, I, yes. that really stuck with me um, so I think um, I'm convinced they're going to do a tremendous job. You know, we discussed the potential conflict of interest. I, I don't think it's um, anything that could slow, should, should, or, or will slow us down. Um, um, but I think uh, one thing that I also liked in this proposal is, is the concept of other. I think we need to recognize that there's certain things that we can kind of bring to the table independent of, of Paul's team's work. Um, so I think, you know, I kind of put a, a pack of gum on everyone's. Uh, um, Thank you in front of them earlier today, and I think, to use uh, Dr. Russell's phrase, uh, walk and chew gum, I think uh, we need to start chewing a lot of gum. <laughs> um, so I, I think in terms of, of the other that I, I think we really need to tackle right now is, uh, you know, kind of boundary adjustments, uh, I'm looking at um, rebalancing the junior highs, so I think now's the time to really start chewing that gum and, and bringing those to, to our uh, citizen task force that, that Paul's going to develop for us. So, I think uh, we got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say um, at last Monday's meeting, when we had the two presentations put in front of us, it was I think it was pretty clear who won the night in terms of you know coming to us with a clear, focused um, presentation and, and what they were their plan for how they were going to attack this issue with us. And I thought Paul was did just did an amazing job. Um, I was definitely one of the ones who was a little more skeptical in terms of the perception of the conflict of interest, and I think I really appreciate the work that Kevin and your team did and, and the legal team in terms of um, kind of squelching those those concerns a little bit with the language in the contract in terms of kind of setting up sort of a checks and balances type of procedure where, um, you know, we'll be able to continually be asking questions and kind of seeing the approach they're taking and, and um, Kind of just being able to to check back in with them as the process goes through so we can continue to kind of monitor how that's all going and and just the transparency of the whole thing i think is is going to be helpful going forward that we had all these discussions and we weren't um kind of blind to the fact that this perception could be out there and i think that's going to be really helpful moving forward and, and i'm really excited to get to get moving on this kind of like you said i think that we have so much work to do and i i think we need to hit the ground running and and start tackling some of the issues so i think it's, it's exciting i believe we've done our due diligence after yeah. like even though i was on, an hour ahead in ohio when <laughs> the hour meeting was continued, um it was very late for me um but i think it, you know we're just right now we're ready to go Awesome. Thank you guys so much for uh, for all the due diligence that's gone into it. Um, you're right. My my main concern was that this just the timing wise that it happened right as we were about to make a decision, more than the actual conflict of interest. I just here here the, we were talking about engaging with somebody and then this was going on in the background. So I'm just glad we were able to have an opportunity to um, discuss it all. And I think just as a reminder to uh, our newer board members that are up here, 
um, that have not worked with an outside consultant yet in this district. This is not a set it and forget it. We don't go, oh great, we engage with somebody. Now they go off and do work. This is an opportunity for us to engage and work with them. Um, we'll be part of the process all the way through. So it's not like we have to worry that somebody's running off and, and, and doing something um, that, that we no longer approve of. This is gonna be a very engaging process for us. So um, get ready to, to walk and chew gum. Yeah, and, and I, the way I kind of uh, word it is we drive, they support us. And, and we're the ones bringing anything forward to the community. So it's, it's not as though we uh, kind of sign the contract and let Paul go off on his own way. We, we need to approve every step of the way. Perfect. Okay, then uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samati. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the contract with Beyond Your Base as a third party consultant for facility planning community engagement pending attorney review. Uh, we have an agreement with the Community Christian Church. Is there a motion to approve the agreement between District 58 and the Community Christian Church for reciprocal services and use of property, including exchanging appropriate insurance coverages, pending final legal review? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? I know that this was uh, something that the uh, members of the PTA and others at Highland uh, brought up as a potential concern when the ownership was transitioning. It sounds like what this is now putting to rest is that concern. Is that accurate that the Highland community is now not concerned about after school program locations? Or is that possible this new owner may not ultimately allow us to use that space for that purpose? Oh, no, they're, inter they're very interested in, in doing exact, continuing on exactly what had been done previously. Um, what had been done previously had never been solidified on paper. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this is a, a church organization that has purchased the church and started a new mission church uh, here. And as its corporate offices is putting everything together, um, they realize, one, they need parking. Um, and two, they want to continue this, this piece with us. So um, we've worked with the, their legal and our legal needs to work out some individual pieces with them in that. And um, that's why it's pending legal review, but it'll be finalized up shortly, probably in the next week or so. And then we'll have that all solidified up with the insurance back and forth. I think it's a great example of partnering with other agencies and organizations within our community for needs. Um, that are viable. Yeah, no, in Karad, I, I fully concur with, with what uh, Todd said. I, I think, if anything, this is formalizing the existing relationship that, that is there, that, that our uh, Highland community values and that we want to continue. Uh, Jill, I also want to piggyback off of something that you said. There's tremendous appetite in Downers Grove right now, and I would include District 58 in this for um, partnerships, whether that's public to public partnerships or whether that's public to private partnerships. Um, there are a lot of resources that if we really sit down with, with these organizations and combine our thinking and our resources, I think we can go a lot further than if we just act, and, and I know this is you know, pretty common sense, but believe it or not, that doesn't happen all the time. And so we're really trying to uh, build on those relationships so we can leverage more opportunities for our students. Great. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the agreement between District 58 and the Community Christian Church for reciprocal services and use of property, including exchanging appropriate insurance coverages pending final legal review. Uh, we have a couple announcements, uh, a couple uh, dates to, to note. Uh, we have a staff meet and greet with the Board of Education on Monday, October 28th at 615 in Whittier. That will be followed by the Board of Education Curriculum Workshop on Monday, October 28th at 7 p.m. in Whittier. There's the Financial Advisory Committee meeting on Friday, November 8th at 7 a.m. at the ASC. We have a community coffee with the Board of Education 
um, on Monday, November 11th, 6.30 p.m. right here at Village Hall. That will be immediately followed by the Board of Education regular meeting on Monday, November 11th at 7 p.m. right here again at Village Hall. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, 5 ILCS 122C1, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students, 5 ILCS 122C10, litigation when against uh, when an action against affecting or on behalf of the district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal or when the district finds that an action is probable or imminent in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered into the closed meeting minutes 5 ILCS 122 C 11 discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes is mandated by section 2.06, 5 ILCS 122C21. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Um, motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. We'll meet at 9 p.m.